I said hello, everybody. <laughs> Woo! Okay. Um, basically, we're supposed to have Maj here to moderate. Um, I suppose he didn't wake up from partying. That's cool. It's DEF CON. Um, it is cool. It is indeed. It is, it is indeed. If Dan says so, it's correct. <laughs> now, um, what we're doing here, I'll go over this presentation real quick because we don't have two hours. We have only one, and that's probably going to go to 40 minutes because everybody is behind schedule. What a surprise. And as we are DEF CON, we are not going to be serious. We hoped to be drunk, but there is no drinking here, and the bar was very far away. So we'll have to excuse us, and especially Dan. You're lucky we came here at all. <laughs> <laughs> and what we're basically going to do, we have no idea what we're going to do, but the basic idea behind what we don't know, that we have no idea or whatever, is to be able to give you guys a glimpse, which you will choose, into not vulnerabilities, not malware, not anything else, but what's going on that's really a threat. I don't care, personally, I don't care about black hat hackers, gray hat hackers, white hat hackers. These guys will probably feel differently, okay, depending on each on its own view. We care about the Russian mob. Again, I have nothing against Russians, and I'm not afraid, so don't say that. <laughs> and uh, last year I said a lot, of, a lot of disclaimers about the Russian mob before they actually said that they're a threat. And this guy thought I was just afraid of Russians, so whatever. So not being funny, uh, the purpose is there is a lot going on on the internet. Some of it involves the mob, the mafia. Some of it involves a lot of guys wanting to make money. Some of it involves spammers. Some of it involves DDoS. And beyond the vulnerabilities, beyond all that we see day to day on Bugtruck or wherever else that might actually be useful, um, there are, there are operations, and that's what we want to discuss from two angles. One, what the bad guys are doing, and two, what's being done to try and counter that. I'm done. Let's go real quick over the presentation, and since Smudge isn't here, hello, Smudge! Yo! No. So Smudge isn't here. Um, Dan is funny. I'm an idiot. We'll co-moderate this panel. Quick introductions. I'm Gadi Evron. Nice to meet you guys. This is Dan fucking Kaminsky. I love this guy. Woo! You guys suck. Um, now, please do excuse us. There are some very serious people on this panel, and they are shocked right now. I did warn them it's DEF CON, and I did warn them we are not going to be serious, although we are trying to be professional. So I'll get the hit, whatever. And you guys just uh, do whatever you want. This is Andrew Freed. He's with the tre Treasury Department. That's how you say it? Yeah, yeah, you don't have to. Also yeah. known as the IRS. Yeah, he's from the IRS. You now know what the IRS looks like. <laughs> but to be serious, he's one of the guys doing a lot, one of the few guys that are doing a lot in law enforcement today. Um, and not to get black hats, to get the guy that steal your grandma's money or make her pay for Mozilla Firefox, so. <laughs> This guy over there is Dan Hubbard. He's one of the greatest guys today to talk about web vulnerabilities and who is actually using them to take your grandma's money or yours. The guy next to him is another one of the best law enforcement officers today going after all these bad guys. He's called Tom Grasso. He's with the FBI. He's the G-man. <laughs> and uh, next to him is Paul Vixi. I don't know how many of you may know him. Yeah! <laughs> He's not law, not law enforcement, come on, he's not the G-man. You can applause. He, um, in a couple of words, wrote Cron, wrote Bind, is probably one, if not, of the, if not the number one, he's probably one of the three most respected network operations guys today in North America. And, well, they can talk about themselves later. later. I, I said they have five words, and if I can have a real geek moment for a second, Buffy, five words. Out for a walk, bitch. I don't know how many of you watch Buffy, but whatever. Um, yeah, Buffy told Spike he has five words, so, okay, never mind. Um, we have a lot of other guys here in the front rows who are part of groups that help mitigate these issues daily. They may just jump on stage at any point and try and answer some questions. Is Nicholas here? Nico? He didn't wake up, okay. And there is Ryan here, I see him. I don't see other people, but I'm blind. So they may answer questions on their own and stuff that they understand better. And now I'll give the mic over to uh, these guys with five words to introduce themselves. Dan, you don't need it. Seriously, you don't need it. 
you can take the mic. My name is Andrew Freed. Woo! Okay. Give it, give it, to, okay, whatever. Dan runs WebSense Labs. You have one more. <laughs> Bitch, okay. I feel like I'm on the dating game. <laughs> okay, say anything. I back feel like you. I'm on a dating game. Yeah, he was like, <laughs> this is not a TCPIP drinking game. That's tonight. You don't get points. Okay. I am not your mama. <laughs> Stop acting like it. Okay, let's get started. I'll go real quick over this presentation and we can get into business. Internet Wars is the name we chose. I don't know why, it seemed cool. We don't know what we're going to talk about yet. Uh, purpose of this panel next. What, is the mean, what it means to have this panel at DEF CON? Well, we figured we discussed these things behind closed doors, secret entry clubs, 50s, I, I don't mean to insult any white people or Christians in here, okay, this is kind of something people say, or I say. 50s, all rich, all white, all Christian clubs, you know, of the internet, that we do the secret security, that we don't let anybody know anything, full disclosure is bad, all that shit. Well, we decided there, there is a reason that security community is so huge, and that basically you guys are the people who face the threats every day, or create them, I don't know. And uh, if, these things, especially those that are already public in a way, need to be dis di disclosed and discussed publicly so things can get done, so your mother doesn't, get pay doesn't pay for Mozilla Firefox. Um, whatever. You're, you're really scared of this whole paying for Firefox thing, man. <laughs> it's not my joke, I stole it, I am allowed. <laughs> I, have, I have to pay for Firefox? <laughs> you feds do. <laughs> okay. Um, the moderator, Maj, I want to hear from you. Come on, Maj, woo! Well, whatever, it will be the TCPIP um, drinking game tonight, and he's great, so be there. Free beer. Um, members. And, and, unless he participates in the DEF CON drinking game, in which case he'll be unconscious. Um, threats, forget that word, it, it's a buzzword. Uh, internet security operations, usually, shut up, usually that means local networks, for example, an ISP or whoever who runs operations and care for their business and their network staying alive. For antiviruses, it means following what new threats, viruses, whatever are out there and getting things done. We speak about the internet itself. Uh, stakeholders of the internet. Who are the stakeholders of the internet? Can anybody shout a name? Who? Okay. There are a lot of stakeholders to the internet, for example, eBay, Google, but they're all, as big as they may be, pretty much centered on their own business. In my opinion, that's my opinion alone, the stakeholders of the internet are Microsoft and the Russian mob. I said that last year. The reason for that, well, you'll see later. Um, yeah. The economics game. What we're talking about is economics. And why are we talking about economics? Because this is not about kiddies. A hacker sitting at home will look for challenges, cool stuff, whatever we want to do. These guys, if they keep developing worms, if they keep funding operation, or operations overseas, physical operations, these phishing attacks, whatever they are, are actually real life fraud operations using the internet. Cybercrime is not about somebody breaking into somebody else's box. It's about using their techniques and their skills to perform real crime. Um, stealing your grandma, whatever. Um, just a couple, one number. It is estimated that by the end of this year, 2006, about $2 billion will be lost from fishing alone. That means fishing alone. Not countermeasures, no preventative measures, not uh, um, reimbursing users, um, whatever is around that, and that's only fishing again. So yes, there is a lot of return on investment for the bad guys, and the good guys are not really sharing information beyond certain circles and then some, I guess, well, not really. Um, what, what people are doing the right thing, fighting on the right side of the fence, we'll discover that in a moment. Um, just in a couple of words, not really everything, but technologies that play a significant part in this fight. The bad guys, they have dynamic DNS providers that they can just say, <coughs> go, register some host, 
um, change the IP addresses or register a new host as far as, and as much as they want. So if they have, for example, a botnet command and control server or a phishing site, they can just keep sites, keep IP addresses or whatever else as quickly as they want. And these services are free, so why not? Uh, fast plugs. Imagine changing your IP address only every 10 minutes. That's kind of cute. Now imagine not doing it for your A record, but actually changing your name server. That's kind of nice. Uh, Trojan horses. A couple of words. Everybody knows about phishing, right? Getting fake websites, emails, whatever, your bank account has been stolen, or whatever. Please enter your password or whatever. Well, today, the game is a little bit different. I'll give you an example. Um, this has been in the news a little bit, not really in a big way. People are not talking about it too much, but it has been published recently. Um, for example, several organized crime groups these days have released different types of Trojans, we can call them worms if you like, that go around, infect people, and then whenever these people, using different hooks, using rootkit techniques, whenever these people would go to an HTTPS site, their credentials would be stolen and reported back to their controller, which means these guys have huge databases of your credentials if you're infected wherever you go. So that would mean a few hundred thousand sites if you're just one of these guys. And say we get um, 10 sites for a person per day, just throwing a number. It gets to gigabytes of information every day of stolen accounts for thousands on thousands on thousands of users. Again, last time I checked, there are several, ter several hundred thousand um, URLs such as these in with one guy who is checking into this stuff. So if you're entering an HTTPS site and your information has been stolen, it is saved somewhere. But that's a lot of data, so somebody has to do something with that. So there, these organized crime groups, for example, would have the triage team, which will look at them, see if there is anything, anything interested, as interesting, do statistics to see if any sites repeat themselves. A lot of users go to center, a certain bank, or a certain bank suddenly developed an online activity that may be interesting to them. They would then pass it on to the operational team, which will steal the money. For example, if there are accounts that are really worth their time, if there is enough money in there. And basically, they do a good job. Then they would have banks or other organizations, not just banks, um, e-commerce sites, that would be directly targeted. So if you enter a direct, some sort of URL, and that URL is in your to watch list, basically, they would download specific regular expressions to steal this data, and it would move in real time. So the transaction can be, with the man in the middle technology on the box itself, the transaction can be altered, and the money can be sent immediately to a money mule, as you do transactions online. There's a lot of technology involved. Trojan horses is a big part of it. Um, if you didn't get that, we'll talk about it tomorrow, so never mind. Um, Hey, Gotti, Gad, yeah. move, move this along. We're half past the hour. Yep. Um, In fact, why don't we start having a conversation about this stuff? I'll, I'll be done in a second. I want to hear myself. Thank you very much. Um, spyware, spam, botnets, whatever. These are all legitimate technologies being used by the bad guys. Um, good guys, well, whatever. So I'm actually interested. Where do we go from here? Now we can start talking. Okay. Dan, thank you. <laughs> All right. So, you know, you're here from the FBI. Um, why don't you tell us about some of the interesting things that you've seen? I mean, from from your from the perspective of actually seeing people, you know, you malware here, you on the ground. What kind of stuff have you seen? Uh, well, um, I, I you know I think what what Gaddy was saying was kind of hidden on on what the big problem is right now is these organized crime groups that are on the internet conducting these different types of fraud and, and scams. And uh, it's, it's I, I guess the way I would sum it up is that it's everything. Everything is related. I, I can't say that um, uh, computer intrusions are a specific problem or phishing is the big problem or spam is the big problem because what we're seeing is that these are all related. They're all part of an underground economy and they, they're all kind of feeding each other and contributing to the problem. Um, I, I know that's, I, I'm not trying to be evasive or whatever, but that's just the reality of the situation right now. Um, you have 
malware that is being written by some very skilled people and they're making money writing their malware and they're selling it to these other people that conduct phishing or they conduct spam or other types of scams. And then uh, the spammers are hiring people to do DDoS against the anti-spam sites. Uh, the, the organized crime groups are doing carding. They're, they're, they're popping e-commerce servers. They're doing phishing to get carding numbers. They're compromising ATM machines. And it's all, it's all feeding, it's all fueling this underground economy that we have right now. Dan, you look like you have something to say. Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, just to get a, an, into a little bit more details, uh, you know, the highest numbers that we're seeing are in um, two areas in Eastern Europe, uh, particularly in Russia. These are the guys that are creating the kits that allow the people that aren't so skilled to, uh, to create these attacks. So those kits, the most popular today is Web Attacker, Root Launcher, and Nuclear Grabber. Those are really the top three kits that are on the internet and being dispersed on the internet today out of those uh, regions. Those are used all over the world, uh, particularly going after banks and e-commerce. Uh, then the Brazilian crews are really all about deception and just simple deception techniques. They're really more about volume and just going after beating signatures in AV. So they're really going after just the low-hanging fruit. Hey, you got a greeting card, click on this, grab it, and they just go after, you know, literally thousands of new variants of bankos uh, every week. Dan, can you, we don't know what kits are. I mean, kits, yes, but... Oh, okay, sorry. So um, what they're doing is they create uh, online storefronts uh, on the Internet, basically for anywhere from 30 to uh, $1,200. You can go online, buy a kit, uh, basically essentially a piece of software. In many cases, it comes with a manual. Um, it shows you how to do an attack online and uh, steal credentials from end users. Uh, another of them, uh, another big group out there is something called the iframe cash biz folks. Um, they're online. They actually front uh, an affiliate program uh, that is really, um, at the end of the day, designed to install adware, potentially unwanted software. And for some of their affiliates, which most likely are their friends or themselves, they're also downloading key loggers and rootkits and uh, stealing credentials from the users. So it's funny, I actually saw this, uh, there, there was one really great piece of spyware adware that actually had a EULA. And one of the things they said is, you know, um, it was picked up off a porn site. And, uh, hey, I have no idea how I Dan, are you it. going to porn sites? <laughs> are you Googling for porn? Did you get lucky? <laughs> Oh, no, it was, it was great, right? It said, um, we reserve the right to deem certain sites as unsafe and to silently redirect you to safe sites. So what they would do is they would wait for people to actually try to buy access to one porn site and would silently redirect the money elsewhere and make it appear that they had gotten the other one. So you'd have these porn sites that, you know, had the steady income and it would plummet because suddenly all their money was being taken and migrated to a different site. Um, Paul, uh, guys, we don't have time, so we'll leave time for questions, okay? Paul, we are getting into the economics, and you're one of the guys to lead that uh, debate. I would really like to hear from you the economics of the problem. Uh, yeah, world-famous economist uh, Paul Vixie <laughs> here. Um, we call this an underground economy uh, in the same way that we would call a protection racket uh, an underground economy. But there are actually a lot of uh, real goods and services moving along these channels. And, you know, ultimately it will be people, you know, bean counters at the IRS who are kicking in these doors because we'll be getting them on tax evasion because in many cases that's the only thing we'll have proof of. Um, what's, you know, I, I liked the characterization Gotti made. This is unusual for me to agree with Gotti, by the way, uh, where he said it's not really... I do know where you live. It's not really a crime to just break into somebody's box, uh, you have to actually damage something. And that's, a, that's sort of always been true. Uh, we've tried to make the victimless crime of, of reading people's files a, a problem, but it hasn't really worked out. There's no global version of that. There is a global version of if you delete their files or if you steal their money, then you're a criminal. Um, so it all has to tie back to the real world, which most of us don't live in. Um, that's why I'm happy we have the Fed and, and the other people here who do, do live in that world. Uh, there are billions of dollars moving around. I hate the, con the, the label that we, that we give. You know, Gotti said that there will be $2 billion lost. Okay, well, it won't actually be lost, right? If it was lost, then it would be buried in holes and no one would know where it was. 
Uh, what, what's happening is the $2 billion are going to be transferred uh, against the will of the people who had it before. So I want to say stolen, not lost. Um, and when you have that level of theft and, and so forth, you've got banks out there. Uh, I've been you know, party to meetings where a bank will say, you know, when it was only $30 million a month, we didn't worry. But when it got to 40, we had to do something. You know, uh, and I, I hate that, but that's the rules of their game. They've got an economic you know, game as well. And this will ultimately come down to people are only going to stop doing something if they can't make money at it anymore. And as long as people, as, as long as my grandma keeps clicking on, yeah, I would like to buy Firefox, uh, then they're going to keep selling it to her. Um, and so, you know, economics is not about money. I've said this at every presentation I've given here. Economics is about human action. That's why von Mises titled his book the way he did. And, you know, if humans are going to keep clicking on this stuff, then human action is going to dictate that there's going to be more and more of this crud for sale. And I don't know how to fix human nature. Question for the panel. Uh, oh, wait, oh, go ahead. Um, Basically, what I'm seeing a lot of from the IRS perspective, we're, we're getting hit with a lot of phishing sites right now. And early on, when we first started seeing these, we actually went out and tried to follow the emails. And we executed search warrants, went into people's houses, took their computers, only to find out they were infected and just being used as an open relay to send out the phishing emails. Then we started trying to follow where the people were coming in and taking over systems they were using to send emails because they stopped using home computers. Most of what we're seeing right now are systems being compromised through really, really simple SSH brute force attacks. When they take over a system, and when they say we, these people take it over, they're using this as a launching pad to get their next round of systems that they can send out three, four, five, six hundred thousand emails and start setting out more phishing sites. Probably, on average, I would say one out of every five systems and people's houses are infected right now. Now, all of you sitting out here saying, ah, screw it, they're too stupid, they deserve it. Suppose somebody got one of your credit cards, and while you're out at DEF CON, you got a call from your bank saying, we just had a charge from Romania, we're canceling your card. And now, you go to play the hotel, and your card doesn't work. You're really screwed. So there's a lot of fallout from these victims that are getting these things. We also have a lot of problems with the money that's being moved, as, as Mr. Vixie said. Uh, anybody here from Romania? I was hoping to make an arrest before I left here, but. <laughs> um, uh, we're seeing a lot of traffic coming from overseas, but you know, interestingly enough, right before I came here, this week, I went and made a charge for $10 of Skype credit. And within about an hour, my bank called me and said, you know, we just got a charge from Luxembourg. Is this legitimate? And I think what that tells us is that a lot of the people that are doing a lot of these crimes related to, like, credit card fraud can't use those credit cards where they live. Those credit cards have to be brought back in the U.S. And there's a couple hot spots that we know of that that happens in, primarily the L.A. area. So. What we really have is not some poor Romanian kid who's just out to try and make his allowance by sending out a fishing kit. What we see is somebody in the United States getting that Romanian to do that, getting the cards back, and then using them here in the States. And to give you an idea how prevalent this has become, you can go on a lot, there's a lot of sites on IRC that you can buy stolen credit cards for $3 a piece. That's how prevalent they've become. Yes. Yes. He so, asked they were fully validated credit cards. <laughs> Where's that? Five, five dollar limits on those cards. I hope if you go there, you find your card on the list. <laughs> we have another visitor. Okay. I'm Nico. I'm running the uh, security group at one of the largest telcos in Europe, and Getty just want me to join. I don't know why. <laughs> Good stuff. So if, if he's from France, Nuke France. <laughs> oh shit! He's sitting next to me. Question. If a stolen credit card is worth only $3 on the open market, doesn't that imply stolen credit cards aren't that easy to monetize? I think it, it implies there are so many of them that it's a glut market. Fair enough. In fact, there, there are sites out there that come up that try and sell a lot of these products. 
And when they first bring the site up online, they'll give these things away to like the first hundred people that sign in. There's a complete underground economy that deals in a lot of this stuff. But it. I'm sorry. The question. How do you buy a stolen credit card? Well, interestingly enough, the gentleman asked, how do you buy stolen credit cards with your real credit card? Uh, they, they generally will use money transfer services like PayPal or, or eGold or some of the, which is the one in Russia, eGold? You would know that. I wouldn't, but I would like to make another note. Um, many, yes, thank you. Shut up, Gaddy. When, yes, yeah, shut up, Gaddy. When some of these guys, I mean, there is the concept we probably all know about called the mule. Okay, the money mule, the drug mule, whatever mule. Um, these guys get emails, I'm sure you all got them. Uh, uh, are you looking for a job, a good job for the summer? Are you able to carry these sized boxes for about twice every week? Yes, this is good, you'll get 75K a year. Of course, you'll get arrested next week, but we won't, we won't tell you that. And these mules, because these guys sit in Romania, they can't get the money directly. So what they do, they use these mules and then say, use Western Union, which is completely um, anonymized, and just you, you only need a password. They'll use the Western Union, send the package out, and the money is gone, poof. So there, there are a lot of ways. For example, some people have been using eBay. For example, I would go to somebody who is uh, a very well-known and respected reseller or client of eBay, and I would buy something for $500. Then I would say, send by mistake 5K. And as that guy has a lot of stars and a lot of ratings, and everybody loves him, and he's a really good uh, uh, business using eBay, he can't risk his business. And I'll send him, hey, dude, I'm really sorry. Please send me my money back. I have to get it today. I made a mistake in the transfer. And the guy will keep 20, 50 bucks for yourself. For, I mean, thank you. And the guy will send back the money to the address you will specify. And they're money laundering again. There are many ways of doing this. But I believe what Paul said is the most critical. This is an economic problem. These are real people and real groups. There have been threats made to people involved in stopping these people from doing what they're doing in the security industry and in other places. And as long as, the, I mean, killing botnet command and control servers, for example, is no longer scalable. You can't really get things done when the bad guys can just keep a server like that or have incredible robustness with their current servers, even if they're just IRC. Or that there are a lot of DNS games and a lot of other tricks they use with really good systems to stay live. Paul will maybe talk about it later from the ISP's perspective or the network operations perspective. The point is you is can't... This, is this... Yeah. What's up? Given that confidence games and fraud and theft have been around forever, what makes you so phenomenally arrogant as to think you can do something to fix... Well, I know why. I know what makes you. <laughs> yeah, you know what makes me so arrogant. What makes you believe that we can actually do, honestly, what makes any of us believe we can do something to fix this variant of it? Okay, there's a problem called drugs, correct? What makes us so arrogant is to believe we can call drugs a problem, or on the other end, what makes us so arrogant to think we can fix the problem of called drugs? So I'll tell you this. First of all, no, I'll tell you this. Yes, you're correct. We cannot fix the problem. It's a reactive game. They are always one step ahead of us and we react. That is why I said it is an economic, economic problem, but that said, if I can stop being an ar arrogant for one second with your permission, I'll tell you this much. I don't have a solution, I don't know who does, but um, if, it won't be two billion, if we don't do something today when it's $2 billion and we keep ignoring it and keep killing small fires instead of dealing with the root problems as far as, as best as we can, um, it will start affecting you as well. Uh, it already does, but Paul was right. It's a human, it's a human nature Paul, problem. Paul, this is for you then. You're right, it's a human nature problem. So I'll tell you what makes me so arrogant on this topic anyway. Um, every new technology that comes along makes some things better and some things worse. And we, as a society, as consumers of that technology, as producers of that technology, have a choice to make about which things are going to get made better and which things are going to get made worse. We didn't have to lose privacy as a result of going to a digital economy. We happen to have done, but we didn't need to. There, there were other ways, and there may still be other ways. And it's still up to us whether we have to have all of these new risks come with all of these new tools. So the question that I've had has been a matter of jurisdictional issues. Um, the way we've dealt with human nature and the way we've dealt with crime 
historically is segment the world up into a small number of jurisdictions that have you know a certain amount of power over a certain region of land. The internet has no geography. It has a global jurisdiction in terms of you know crime can come from anywhere. What are we seeing? Are we seeing advances on the international crime control front? Uh, definitely. I, I mean, I, I think, but you know, the point that you make really is an important one. Is that, yeah, the the internet knows has no boundaries. Um, I work for the FBI. I have no jurisdiction anywhere in the world that's not in the United States. So, um, if I have a subject that's over in Italy or or, or over in uh, Romania. Um, I, I have no jurisdiction over there. Now I can go to the authorities over there and, and, and try to make a case to them and say, hey, here's somebody that's causing a problem. We would like you to do something about it. But there's nothing I can do to force them to do something about it. So um, international co cooperation is, is a key, I think, to, to getting our hands on this problem you know, from a law enforcement perspective. Um, and we, we have made great strides in that area. There are countries that you know, five or ten years ago, um, if if I went, uh, if somebody came to me with a case where we traced it back to this country, uh, my response would have been, um, there's, "I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do about it. These people just don't cooperate with us. We get no response from." That, that's changing. We're starting to see cooperation come out of the most unlikely of places. But part of the problem is, is that a lot of these countries w that are sources are the main sources of the problem. They don't have the law enforcement resources in place to deal with it. So they're uh, they're they're law enforcement agencies are not familiar with cybercrime. They're not, they're, they don't have the training, the equipment to, to conduct cybercrime. You mentioned Romania. Um, I, I, I can tell you stories from uh, FBI agents that have been over to visit Romania and have done things like bought printer paper and things like that for the Romanian police because they didn't have stuff like that for their for their for their printers and, and bought them floppy disks so just so they'd have floppy disks because they're so underfunded you know that's the situation they're in so you know, I think one thing is uh, is is this disparity between you know the law enforcement resources that we have here in the US which there are quite a, a few versus the law enforcement resources that are in other spots of the world and and we're we're you know we can't affect those things in the other uh, Tom, parts of the world one question though yeah um, in the recent couple of years law enforcement in the United States especially but in Europe as well and other places around the world really started making a difference in, in small strides but making a difference in, in, in themselves by taking these issues seriously raising cybercrime to a higher priority but still it's on the policy level these issues are not that important uh, and Obviously, rape and murder should be more important, but what's being done today in the United States, not around the world, for example, to make things better? Law enforcement um, involved. Right. So in the United States, for instance, uh, I can't speak for the IRS, but FBI, uh, cyber crime is the FBI's number three priority. So um, it's, uh, it's actually our number one criminal priority. Uh, what I mean by that is that our other two priorities above cyber crime are, are terrorism, um, and, and counterintelligence, uh, which are really um, not criminal issues. So our first criminal priority is is cybercrime, and we have more FBI agents that are are working cybercrime than ever. And um, we're trying to build alliances with other law enforcement agencies. One of our, our our best partners right now is the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. They're doing an outstanding job uh, fighting cybercrime and making inroads, uh, particularly into the carding stuff and things like that. And also trying to to develop resources with with folks out there outside of law enforcement. I think that's one of like people that are here on this panel right now. People in the audience. I think you know these are our our best assets that we have at this point to help us with the problem. I also see that um, Interpol has been facilitating a lot of things you know internationally, and you know I think you even have a working group nowadays at Interpol that actually deals with cybercrime. Yeah, yeah, we we. Um yeah, just to follow up on that, we really are putting much more emphasis on the on the international connections, and um, we we have relationships with Interpol, with the with the folks uh, over at Scotland Yard, over in the UK, uh, all over the world. If uh, that's really where we see we see that being critical to being effective at this problem is 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 forming these alliances with these other law enforcement agencies. I know, I know just quickly, um, some of the disclosure laws, uh, like in California, for example, which probably um, good chance are they're going to be federal, where companies actually, publicly traded companies have to disclose, public entities like universities have to disclose when they've had security problems and identifiers have been leaked out. That's throwing a lot of money at the problem. Um, you know, it, it's actually an ancillary benefit, but some of these laws have actually are benefiting that. Is disclosure actually happening? Like, on a large scale, when there are issues, 
I mean, choice our point. Our company's actually, well, yes, choice point. But, you know, for your everyday compromise of 50,000 credit cards, are people actually telling anyone or are they just keeping it in secret? I don't think, uh, if we are to put organizations with their security um, flux aside for one minute and if they disclose it or not, or this or not, there is a huge problem with um, the, the losses that are occurring with actual Trojan horses, um, breakings into sites, all these issues I can name millions of identities, online identities being stolen every day. And now nobody really takes notice to this yet because this is not one organization that gets it. The problem today with information security management is that you need to secure the end user which may not be under your control or even related to you instead of your own sites. Fair enough. So I think we have a few questions in the audience. Um, why don't you go ahead? Um, it seems like America's uh, solution to a lot of problems is when it gets so bad, we got to legislate, we got to throw laws at it, and that's what our legislature does based on uh, the agency yelling at them to do something about this. So as this number, this two billion, use the to, microphone. Yeah, if you've got a microphone right there, why don't you? AV people, is it on? Yes, it is. Excellent. Let's try that Check. again then. What my real question is... Anyone else, just go ahead and get in line. As this 2 billion number continues to increase and eventually becomes 5, 10, or 20, do you think that we'll ever see a great firewall of America where we are trying to keep these, co these countries like Romania and Russia and Brazil and where most of the attacks are coming from and, you know, botting people's uh, computers and then attacking or, or relaying, do you think we'll ever start legislating that where we're trying to keep the other countries out? Every time we've seen national-scale firewalls, you, we see large-scale proxy avoidance and large-scale proxying uh, become an everyday facet of the hey, Dan? Well, there'll always be ways around it, but I, what, my real question is, do you think that it's going to get to the point that they want to try and Dan? legislate it? Uh, Andrew from the IRS will answer just one thing. Two billion from phishing alone. It's more than two for just credit cards alone, credit card theft alone, <coughs> and so on. Just one small note. Andrew? Right. Paul? Well, you know, so uh, so, we found... Oh, actually, no, go ahead. Don't hurt yourself, Dan. Uh, you know, what we found is legislation in and of itself doesn't ensure compliance, and I think that we're going to take technical steps to eliminate what makes a lot of this possible. And while legislation might be helpful in some situations, a lot of this stuff happens outside the country where our laws don't apply. Paul? You know. uh, in answer to your specific question, would we see legislation around that, I would say no because uh, the risk of a false positive where a potential buyer or a seller that could be helping the American economy would be kept out by such a firewall is way too high. So they will take the phishing and the spam and everything else with it as long as there are potential legitimate buyers and sellers of American goods and services. Uh, Congress knows where, you know, where the feathers in, in its nest came from. And you know, and from a technical perspective, from the from the service provider side, you're going to see that whatever the legislation is going to be, it's going to be difficult, and not to say probably impossible, to deploy it in any large-scale network. You know, so doing something for a couple of end users is one thing. You know, making it scale to millions of users is a nightmare, and that's why we also see that you know most of the solutions, you know, maybe except the Great Firewall of Ch Firewall of China, and even that one, you know, there's there's tons of ways to get around it. You know, never survive in a network because it just doesn't scale up, and you know as Paul said, you know, false positives and whatever. Another question? Hello. At my job, I've, uh, we often get people that attack my network to get to my customers. And what uh, I find is uh, a lot of legitimate, almost, quote unquote, businesses are using affiliate programs to shield themselves from any sort of liability. Oh, it wasn't us, it was a bad affiliate, we're getting rid of them, and then three days later, they're, they're at the no, same I, stuff again. And what I'm wondering is, one, is there legislation which allows you to go after the end, you know, the you know, company that may or may not be legitimate, and also, these legitimate companies, banks selling your uh, email information and whatnot, how much do you feel this affects legislation? Like, you know, the legislation we have for spam right now was watered down horribly because the financial institutions that want to sell your information to spammers make sure that it's very weak. And how does that affect law enforcement? Because we have mainstream businesses purposely watering down these laws because they're making money from it too. We have real problems with uh, a reluctance to, just to take what you just described and describe it as organized crime. It is. The affiliate programs are a shell game and a mechanism of redirection that makes it difficult to apply legal remedies. 
and no one is willing to really go ahead and change the law to say, you know what, what's going on in the adware industry has destroyed millions of machines and is organized crime and needs to be dealt with criminally. Yeah, th there was a pretty good case last week. Woo! Woo! Um, Beer is on me. Where uh, a, a Warner Brother website and a group of Warner Brother websites like ScoobyDoo.com actually were serving up child por or pornography, so pornography to kids basically through an adware network. So, I mean, it, it's definitely a serious problem. Uh, yeah, just the one comment I would make on the first part of your question. Uh, the FTC has been doing a lot of work lately in going after these affiliate programs. Um, if you're, in terms of spam, they've been going after the affiliate programs, uh, suing them, getting very large judgments against them because, yeah, that, the affiliate program is really a heart, at the heart of the problem. They sign up these affiliates, they tell them in their user agreement, they say, well, if you spam, we're going to cut you off or whatever, or we're not going to pay you. But I mean, that's what they're saying up front. In reality, people are using spam to advertise these websites. So the, I have to say the FTC is making some good inroads with that right now. The FTC is a civil, deals with civil judgments. Yeah. And the bottom line is, is that, you know, I was just talking to people from the FTC about this. They've done a lot with the jurisdiction they have. They've done a lot with the powers they've been granted. It's not enough. The law is not encoding the fact that millions of machines have been destroyed by these bastards. One quick note, guys. We're, we were in a real hurry to get the, the thing uh, wrapped up. If you guys are interested, we are now good to go on past the hour, so we are going to slow down a little bit and not be so, I'm not going to be so stressed out. Sorry, Dan. Go on. All right. Um, another question? Yes. I know a lot of the uh, problem is, is there isn't any type of consistency internationally. I can't hear you. Sorry. Pardon? Um, be close I know that you know part of the problem um, internationally is there isn't consistent laws. You know what might be a crime here in the U.S. may not be a crime, you know, somewhere else. So what type of efforts are there on the diplomatic level, you know, to try to create uniform laws, uh, treaties, etc., to put some standards behind? You know, if you do this, you know, it's a crime anywhere in the world. Uh, again, uh, to that I would say that it's all part of what we're trying to do as far as our outreach to other countries is is uh, get some laws on the books that, that affect this stuff. No, but you're right. In some places it's not it's not even a criminal act to commit a computer intrusion. Uh, but, you know, usually with legal uh, diplomatic agreements that we have, uh, mutual legal assistance treaties with these other countries, we can have some type of investigative steps taken there uh, based on the fact that it's a, a crime here in the U.S. Um, but the problem comes to be is that for stuff like this, they're probably not going to extradite somebody over something like this. If it's murder, they'll extradite them. So yeah, you still need to convince this foreign country to go ahead and prosecute the person. Um, and that's, that's part of the challenge. Is cyber crime included in most ad-lads? Yes, it is. There is a line over there to speak. Yep, you're clarified now the appointment to the doctor, yes, just a, prescri a prescription, right? Yeah. Go guys, ahead. can we get some technical questions too? We have some technical guys here. Hello. Um, earlier, Gotti said that there are millions of identities stolen every day. And if I happen to come by some, whether they're with credit cards or just the identity, it, like a U.S. citizen's, um, is there a place to uh, send these identities if one comes by them so that some action... By email, clear text, right? <laughs> well, I, I, I've actually tried to call them and explain to them that I've found this and they might be interested in knowing that it's, uh, that it's out there and they get pissed and they say they're going to call the police and the FBI and I'm like, well, that's great. But um, is there a place yeah. that these... If there's a million out there every day... Is there a facility that is, is, has the capability to take them in and do something with them? Yeah, you, you can report stuff like that to the Internet Crime Complaint Center. The website is www.ic3, that's India Charlie, the number 3.gov. And uh, they have an online form where you can report stuff like that. Um, I, you know, I, or you I don't can know just if you mail can, it to Tom. Or you can mail it to me if you'd like, yes. Um, but probably the best thing to do is to go to IC3 and, and report it there. And can you take thousands per day or tens of thousands per day? Uh, I, I, I'm thinking right now if they have the ability for you to attach a file to it as opposed to like putting in, you know, a thousand. I mean, you could certainly put in something and say, I've got a thousand of these, ten thousand, and here they are. What are they going to well, do the with a hundred thousand of them in a day? And I, I can tell you, I've actually tried to get a hold of, of uh, some of the credit card companies when we've taken over some of the phishing sites and found data there, 
and they didn't even return my phone call, so. <laughs> now they're being audited, by the way. But. <laughs> <laughs> just but a joke, just, just a, a joke. Well, one last just, comment, <laughs> is, is, and, and what to do about Nobody heard, he said it was a joke. Nobody quote him on it, please. <laughs> And, and what to do bad reporters, bad DEFCON reporters. Down, Gotti. And, and what about the international stuff uh, from Great Britain or the UK, uh, uh, Australia, Germany? Well, you, usually what we see as a service provider, you know, the best way forward when you find such websites, you know, it's at least report them to the National High Tech Crime Units. Uh, and, there's uh, actually an organization called APAX uh, for Europe that works with the banks to... For facilitate. England, not Europe. Well, we... <laughs> No, they, they actually work with other, other countries also. So they also deal with uh, Australia and a couple other... And Ireland. And Ireland, yeah. <laughs> but, Sorry, Northern Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've actually had pretty good luck uh, working with the credit card companies directly with their security officers. And uh, basically, as long as you're giving them just their credit cards, they will uh, um, you know, take at and then monitor those accounts. So... If anybody wants to pass them my way, I'll pass them that way. <laughs> is, is it sure? <laughs> is it the sense of this panel that this is not a technical problem, that the technical faults we're seeing here are so low level and so easy that really our limitations are legal jurisdiction? Uh, we, I've actually seen a lot of, I mean, like iframe cash were the guys that were actually exploiting WMF before it was known. So. Uh, I mean, these guys are used in zero days. It's, it's not just a click here and get infected scenario. I mean, obviously that happens, and there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, but, I mean, they're using some pretty sophisticated tools that, you know, through, you know, Google poisoning of search results and, and other things, you can get infected without, you know, being uh, deceived in some way. I mean, you know, but, I've seen a lot of these... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I've seen a lot of these phishing sites, and to me they've almost become a non-invasive DNA test for intelligence. You know, we have people that will call us and say that they're responding to a refund and they live in some country that doesn't even pay taxes to the IRS. So it's always difficult to protect somebody from being stupid. And as long as we have that low element of stupidity, these things aren't going to go away. I mean, remember that companies around the world send marketing emails from other domains that they don't own. They don't use SSL quite often. I mean, this is a big problem. This isn't just a, a dumb user sitting in front of a computer. We're training the behavior of the users. So if you're training them incorrectly, that's what you get. I would like for Paul, we're surprised right now, to try and answer all that about, uh, because guys, everybody, everything, every type of technology can be played with. But I believe Paul himself is kind of close to one of those, not, not specifically SSL certificates, that say, hey, this site is secure. Or you can pay a little bit more and say, really secure. But Paul has been dealing with DNS for a long time, and that's also a huge part of what you're talking about. So I'd like to get some of Paul's comments. Um, OK, so DNS is not secure. Uh, pretty much anybody who wants you to believe that a certain name maps to a certain address can make you believe that no matter what the name or the address might be. Uh, there are solutions that have been sort of log jammed inside of the IETF for close to 12 years um, and we're sort of undergoing the periodic uh, two-year cycle uh, where we think we're done but then we're not really done and we're going to start over soon. Um, now, if we could get people to pay attention to the fact that this email came from Czechoslovakia but claims to have come from Visa International, and it's actually a DSL-connected machine in Prague somewhere, uh, then the fact that the DNS names are not authentic would begin to matter because people would begin to forge them. But right now it is so easy to get people to click on just about anything that you don't have to actually exercise any of the weaknesses of DNS. Uh, but that will be the next frontier if we can just close the holes they're using now. Another question? Yeah, earlier somebody uh, asked about uh, legislation and firewalls for, uh, like, the great firewall of America. Uh, the panel sense was that probably wouldn't happen. What is the panel sense on legislation regarding monitoring of Internet traffic uh, as a defensive measure, uh, say, and then follow on with more... Uh, uh, legislation along, along, along the lines of CALEA? Well, you know, China does, in fact, have a national firewall system. 
yet probably 60% of the fishing sites originate from China. So the firewalls aren't going to solve a problem. It's not going to happen. Well, it, or is that a matter of political will? They simply do not have the political will to stop this behavior. Well, most, most security uh, types, I think, would, would say that a firewall is not a magic bullet. Uh, I certainly don't believe that it is. I think it goes hand in hand with monitoring and other things, which is why I have a question about monitoring. I don't think there's a way to find out what's being monitored without a lawsuit, so go talk to the EFF people about that. We'll be doing that today. Although there's an interesting question, actually. What should be monitored? I mean, you know, that's kind of the elephant in the room. What is, the actu what is actually appropriate to monitor on the global Internet? Well, and under what circumstances? Well, what kind of crime are you Are you sure about? we want to go there? Yes. Yeah. Why not? Okay, then. We're technical. No, no, no offense. I'll here. start with Paul. He boundary. is the political guy here. Um, I would say, you know, what do we feel comfortable having monitored outside of cyberspace? Do we want all of our personal conversations monitored in case we're talking about crime? Uh, no. And so the, I would extend that directly in. The only monitoring that ought to happen is the monitoring that one endpoint or the other chooses. All right. All right. I guess that's me. Um, I work for a company that uh, takes this very seriously. We tracked um, exploitations um, basically that were being hosted in an IP space range hosted in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, when we try to work to get it taken down, one of the things that we bump up against, and we bump up against this in Brazil as well, is corruption, which enables uh, these actors to basically, you know, act with impunity. So, uh, you know, you can deal with all the Interpol stuff as, and, you know, as aggressively as you want, but there's still areas where corruption rules. The money is basically funding, you know, its self-survival. So, you know, how do you, you, you know, start to tackle that as well? Because legislation here isn't necessarily going to take care of these issues over there. Right. We, we can't always fix all these problems, but I can remember when the very early phishing sites came up, it was impersonating the IRS. It was in Mexico, and we could not get the Mexican authorities to do anything. Um, what we ended up doing is they did a really simple trace route between my system and the phishing site and looked at the last ISP before it went outside the country, and I asked them to put a block against it, which they did. Not to say that all ISPs are that responsive, but we can't control what's outside the U.S. We can try and prevent people from getting to it, but once again, we don't control sites outside the IRS, uh, the U.S. At this point, I would like to note, though, and I'll le let Nico say something because it's really, he, feel, he, feel, he feels very strongly about it. Um, actually, I would like to direct this to Tom. Tom, we always like to talk about abroad, but m most of these problems originate from one place, and one place alone, and you know, okay, not Florida. Russia. Not Russia. Um, and you know what that place is, and there are a lot of ISPs, and I would like to direct that to Paul right after him that are not so responsive here in the United States, and we know who they are, it's public knowledge. What are we doing about it? Um, so if, if the ISP is here in the US, it's a lot better situation oh, than... I'm sorry, I'm sorry yeah. for coming in. Guys, I love the ISPs in the US. Most of them are very responsible and very responsive. Just some of them are not, and for a very long time. Yeah, that, part of the problem is, is that um, there's, there's no law that mandates that an ISP has to keep any sort of records of anything. So if we go to an ISP and say, here's a subpoena, please identify this customer of yours, they can say, oh, you know, we don't keep records or we only keep them for three days and you missed, you missed the cutoff. There's really nothing that we can do, you know, from a law enforcement perspective on that. We can't say, oh, well, that's, uh, that's irresponsible, you're a bad corporate citizen, shame on you. I mean, that's really the, the extent of, of what we can do. Um, now, there's always talks of legislation about mandating ISPs to retain some, some sort of records um, and then have those records available to law enforcement if law enforcement comes to them with the appropriate legal process. But um, if the ISP chooses not to maintain these records, it's it's just a situation that we're in, and I, I think this is again where the where the the public, private, I'm sorry, the private sector people come in and uh, play a role as far as identifying those rogue ISPs and and, and doing things to uh, hamper their their business model. What about the rogue ISPs that have things running right now and have been running them right now, not three days ago, for the past years? Um, yeah, uh, again, if it's if it's here in the U.S. and and they maintain records then then it's something that's 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 definitely doable it's the situation ISP, they don't maintain this is the ip record. address that's been bugging me for two years now i'm sorry what's that hello isp 
you are one of the few not nice ISPs in, in the United States. These are one, two, three, four IP addresses being used right now for a botnet command and control server sending out phishing emails and stealing money. They are being used right now and have been used for the past two years. What's going on? Is it illegal? And it, it, here, I guess it comes down to this. Is it illegal to provide hosting services to a known criminal site? And if so, um, what sort of liability do these guys have for putting this stuff on the net? Yeah, so um, I'm not a lawyer, okay, so, but I, I don't, I, I think the issue comes down to, you know, plausible deniability. I think that's really what the issue is. Um, and, and I have run into this many times where we, we go to an ISP, there's some type of, of mischief coming out of the ISP. Uh, we go to them uh, with legal process and they say, oh, boy, you know, I didn't even know this was a problem. You know, if you just would have told me or if somebody would have called up and said something, we would have pulled the plug on these guys. Um, I mean, it's plausible den deniability. It's very hard. Now, w the reality of the situation, no, you're, you're right, Gotti. You're absolutely right. No, the reality of the situation is there are places out there that are, that are um, uh, uh, basically havens for these, for these criminals. There are some ISPs that are, that are out there, and, and these guys go there, and they know they can park themselves there. Um, but uh, again, it's 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 a matter. It's my job as a law enforcement officer uh, to follow up on that. It would be somehow proving that the ISP knows that the person was a criminal coming in there and going to do something criminal. If I can't prove that they know that, then I have no right to even talk about it with them. All right, that's just the way. That's just the, the situation. Got it. Yeah. Th there, there is just a one law. second though. Pull. So we're talking about money again. Um, let's talk about the voice market. Uh, where you're using a cell phone or your you know, wireline telephone. If you read your phone bill, you'll see references to all kinds of FCC tariffs, PUC tariffs. That's where the rates are being set or at least controlled, monitored in various ways by the government. There are surcharges. There are all kinds of things going on there. It has been true for about the last 25 years that the dominant cost of providing telephone service is in maintaining accurate billing records and not in carrying the traffic. Um, and that's dominated the cost of all of the telecommunications equipment, the big switches, everything that's got voice lines going into it, would be way smaller, way cheaper, would innovate much more quickly if they didn't have to maintain call detail records and you know, keep them for a certain number of days and so on. None of that stuff exists on the Internet. And so you can imagine, let's say that 90% of the cost of sales for a voice telephone network is around billing and record keeping. Um, you're dealing with internet service providers whose entire margin might be less than 10%. And you might be asking them to use a third of that to maintain the kind of records that the FBI would very much like them to have. And they can't do it until and unless all of their competitors are required to do it too, because otherwise they'll be the one that costs 3% more than all the competitors. So I do believe in that sense that we're trending inevitably toward legislation that is like what we do with the voice network to start to control the other way, uh, the other kind of telecommunications that makes the world go round. Yeah, the only thing is, when you look at it in Europe, right, um, there's the EU Data Retention Act, and that one is basically, um, you know, you have to keep CDRs for voice and internet traffic. And uh, they want to, you know, push it even, you know, farther. You know, at the moment, it's just like, you know, username, IP address, timestamp. What they're asking for is net flow for, from all your border routers, you know, into another country, okay? <laughs> So at least your know, EMC is going to be happy, you know, if, if that one gets passed. There are a few laws in the U.S., specifically the DMCA law, that if a website is hosting copyrighted material, the ISP can become uh, can become um, a, a liable for that information. So if you contact the ISP and the ISP does not shut down that site they can be sued by the owner of the copyright information. We've used that quite a few times to bring out phishing sites um, pretty yeah, directly. The, the, yeah, and, and that's, yeah, and that's one of the things that works in cases of phishing sites. You can say that they're, they're infringing on Citibank's copyright or, or whatever. So yeah, that works in that case. But that's one of the few laws I know that actually you know, We've boxes the ISP into some having to, to go forward with some type of action. There, there, there's another law. If it's child pornography, they're required yeah, to that, that report one, it and do something about it. But, you know, so phishing sites, bot networks, stuff like that. We don't have that type of legislation on the books right now. Well, like I said, if, if the phishing site is hosting copyrighted material, which most of the time they always are, um, you know, they've got the graphics or, or something that was produced by the company um, and, and copyrighted by the copyright on the page of the original, where they took the original information from, 
Um, I mean, we've had very good response with, with, with ISP shutting that, down that information because they don't want to be liable for that, for that DMCA uh, issue. So. The only thing you have to remember in that case, you, you're only really talking about company providing hosting, right? Yes. If, uh, you have to remember that most of the telco licenses require that you never ever look into traffic except for debugging maintaining the network purposes. Well, if, it, if, the, if it's reported to them, then, the, then they become liable for, return, for removing that information. Uh, they have to shut down that website or that server. Well, it's U.S. law. I mean, it, well, it depends. That's maybe specific to the U.S. It right? is very specific oh, yeah. to the U.S. It's U.S. law, so it only works if the server is in the U.S. So. In theory, yeah. No, yeah. no. We've we've actually had a hundred percent success rate on bringing down. Hundred percent. We have had ninety nine percent success rate. <laughs> really? Actually, Rob Slade said something very interesting. I don't remember the last one. Um, as we get a lot of success too in cooperation from law enforcement and the ISPs globally, but there are certain things that will re really get things done. And that's the four, the four horsemen of the internet. I remember only the, the first three. Rob Slade is a great guy. Um, child pornography, copyright laws, uh, copyright issues, um, terrorism, and MP3 music, I think. I don't remember really. The four horsemen of the internet to get things done. Yes. It is actually kind of amusing then. We have stronger controls over MP3 music than we do over your wallet. <laughs> Another question? Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, from the panel we've heard a lot of different things about, uh, I guess, the bad guys using things from very simple websites to zero days. I'm sort of interested in the panel as a whole talking about the technical sophistication, how it's progressed recently, and sort of where you think it's going. And basically, are, are the bad guys getting ahead of us, or are we keeping up with them, or are we catching up to them? No, yeah, the we're getting our butts kicked. Um, there's no doubt about it. The, uh, I mean, the technical solutions that are out there are not even close to, to what these guys are doing. Um, the, the research, the cooperation amongst other parties, I mean, th they obviously have businesses too, and they don't collaborate probably as much due to business reasons um, as, as they could, but there's, there's a lot stronger bond of, of sharing of tools and information in their society than there is in ours, definitely. It's actually pretty impressive when you see the kind of software, the front end, you know, web interfaces to, you have a botnet of 100,000 hosts. How do you control that? I mean, you can't control that with just little shell scripts. So you really are getting some incredibly mature tools for managing these large scale networks. Um, the, you know, there's, there's nothing, I don't think there's anything like this on the defensive side, is yeah, there? Yeah, well, I think, I think part of the problem is it's, it's, not, it's not that they're, you know, uh, uh, way far ahead of us, it's just that it's an arms race. So the nature of this is that once something's, uh, once the good guys come up with a solution, the bad guys are able, are allowed to develop a countermeasure to it or something better. And that's, that's just what we see going on, is we see a, just a, a, an arms race uh, in this whole thing. Um, that, that's, that's what I think is part of the problem. And the main point behind that is that we are, and in any warfare, the defensive guy is always going to be reactive, period. And when we, we live in, aside to being humans and reacting this way, when we live in a capitalistic society and it's, everything is about business, you're not going, like, like Paul said about banks, and the banks really know how to do their risk assessments. If the problem right now costs them money, but they will lose more by investing to stop it, They'll not do anything about it because it's not worth their time yet. Now it is, about what we discussed earlier. And there are a lot of problems out there. Some of them are going to show up in a few years. Some of them are going to be, have been ignored for years. And for example, botnets, phishing, all this stuff has been known for a very long time. Routing issues, DNS, as Paul mentioned, it's been worked on for many, many years now. But the, biz the business incentive to kill the problem was not there when the problem was small. Spam, for example, was ignored originally. And when it comes down to it, these problems become unstoppable, become too large to be stopped, and all we can do is enter that arms race when, with them inventing new technologies and us running after them, while we, at very different angles, all deal with certain business needs such as antiviruses, ISPs, to try and maintain our own businesses, while these guys have one business alone, and that's exploiting people in order to make money. And they're going to keep exploiting people in order to make money because when you have an ROI of billions of dollars every year, and phishing is just something that's in plain sight, there's a lot more going on. If one avenue, if one channel is being closed or challenged, there is going to be retaliation. I've got a question for the panel. Just I'd like to get each of your opinions on this. Really short thing. Will online banking survive? 
I, I think it will survive if they adapt and, and put in protections that require authentication, that's something people have and not just something they know. Until they go to like smart cards with certificates, we're going to start to see a problem. All right. Yeah, I think they will. I mean, th their business model is dependent on it. I mean, when was the last time you went and sat in a line with your little book to the, you know, to talk to a teller? So, I mean, they're saving. It was, it's a beautiful business model. I mean, get rid of all your people, put a computer up, and then charge people to use the computer. I mean, that's a great business model. So, there's a lot at stake there. And it's good to use, too. I've got a comment, too. Yeah, I mean, you, you, absolutely. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. So you said, you know, um, certificate, smart card, or whatever, you know, but you still have to trust the PC, right? And the issue, I mean, you guys discussed at the beginning with all the malware. So, you know, then you're going to need something like trusted platform, you know? <laughs> all the things you guys are going to like. And or the other option, I mean, we see coming more and more is out-of-band authentication for transactions. You know, trusting like GSM network, which you can trust much more than the internet when somebody wants to do wire transfer to an external party. That would be one of the options we see. And I also think it's going to survive, as you said, because of the business model. Yeah, I think it's a matter of economics as long as it continues to make money for them. And, and they've been able to accept the losses so far, so I don't see that changing. But I would say this. I mean, just, just think about this. If, um, if you get your credit card statement, you see there's a couple laptop computers from ti TigerDirect.com on there, and, and you didn't buy those, and you call up your bank and say, hey, uh, hey bank, I, I didn't buy these laptop computers, your bank's going to say, Okay, fine. We're going to reverse those charges. We're taking that money off your credit card. We're going to make you whole again. And and you walk away from that sitting thinking, "Boy, that's really nice in my bank. They care about me. They just they just ate all that money there on my behalf." But the real anyone here is anyone here an e-merchant? You know what the reality of that situation is? Who who gets stuck with that bill? Tiger Direct gets a charge back at the end of the month, okay? So it's it's uh it's it's I'm not trying to bash the banks or anything, but um, this problem is hurting them, but it's hurting other people more. So I, I, uh, until that model changes, I, I don't. I think it's going to continue to go on. The web channel itself is that the web channel is the cheapest channel available to the banks to deal with us lame users who don't have billions in our accounts, and they will do whatever is in their power, including reimbursing everybody completely, where it is by law or where they have to do it regardless. In the UK, it's a law, and the user therefore do not really bother fixing their computers. In Germany, it's not, and the user's trial will be harder. But um, as long as the web channel can remain active, it will remain active because their goal is one, maintaining the trust of users in e-commerce. That's critical for them. And to be honest, just one F-related note, the banks are doing a lot, seriously. Um, but in the United States, both on the attacking side with phishing sites and on the defending side, uh, side with the sites of the banks and other e-commerce, actually not just banks, the technology is way behind. The, the attacks that people see in Europe and the defenses that banks put in Europe are a lot more advanced. The UK is in the same trouble, only that the attackers are very, very advanced and the banks are at the same technology level of defense. But seriously, the U.S. has not yet seen what the rest of the world has seen. So, actually, I have a question then. If we have a scenario where the Europeans are using much stronger protections on online banking, are their fraud rates lower? What? Are their fraud rates lower? Has it helped? The bad guys just invented new stuff, but yes, it has helped. Yeah, I think just quickly on the banks, the, uh, Europe has a significant advantage against the U.S., and it's a much smaller in, uh, number of entities where they actually can work together. I mean, there's literally tens of thousands of credit unions in the U.S. I mean, it's not easy to get all these people in one room. It's not legislated. I mean, it's all over the place. It's not near as easy of a problem to, to tackle cool. to their cool. defense. So, Dan, in answer to your question, will online banking survive? Uh, we've answered so far on the panel uh, from two perspectives. One is, you know, can you log in, see your balances, make your payments? And the other is, some of us has, have answered, uh, will we continue to be able to buy things with credit cards on the web? Um, right now, you know, you're using a 16-digit credit card number uh, around a four-digit expiration date and around a three- or four-digit CVV code as the way that you're authenticating yourself. Sometimes they'll ask you for your zip code or something like that. It's very, very weak. Uh, but of the two types of online banking fraud or loss or, I guess, theft, 
that we're seeing. I, I think the credit card uh, money transfers that are illegitimate are vastly outnumber the online banking transfers that are illegitimate. Uh, not that you don't see phishing sites where people are trying to collect your online banking information, but it's just much more common to see a dollar stolen uh, uh, through a credit card transaction. I know that the world could not survive without that flow. Uh, the, those uh, uh, flows in the economy are now, the, that's, that's our lifeline. That's how we deal with each other. Uh, but I'd, I think that uh, around 20 ASCII numeric digits of authentication is not going to survive. I do not agree with our esteemed colleague from the IRS that two-factor authentication is going to be the solution. That's already been shown to be too weak. So I'm, I think that the next uh, step forward is going to be uh, a bigger step than just moving to the two-factor thing with the secure cards. And we are certainly going to have to have a more trustworthy computing platform, of which I hope that TCPA is not it. I just want to add something on top. I mean, we have been talking a lot about the banks, but you know, you, you guys know that most of the new point of sale systems hang on the internet actually, and they store your credit card when it got swiped, and that people can make, make transactions on top of them, you know? So that's, you know, we, we're really focusing on the banks and online phishing and so on, and then you, then you have all those post systems, you know, hanging everywhere in every single shop, on the internet, on a wireless LAN and so on. Hey, and you can find so many nice things on them. So you know that's something that's happening in the background that nobody cares about at the moment. You know, but it's going to hit us hard at some point. Let's uh, try to go through our questions here. Um, what do you guys think of some of the volunteer phishing incident response teams? And uh, do you have any favorites? Uh, I have a couple personal favorites. Uh, Castle Cops has uh, been a great help in the phishing area. Uh, spam house in the spam phishing and other sorts of network mischief area. Um, there's uh, there's there's really a, a lot of groups that I rely on as a law enforcement officer. I think they're um, you know people that are really well. If you saw my talk earlier, I call them the white knights of the internet. They're helping keep the wheels on the internet. Uh, and uh, pe <clears throat> people like uh, the groups that Gaddy has put together that uh, that I've worked with on uh, different different uh, malware outbreaks and things like that. Really, people are helping keep keep wheels on things. It's, I think it's interesting that uh, I don't think without this these home growing volunteer organizations organizations on the internet, it would be the internet that we know it, know it is today. I think it would be significantly different. You know, funny, funny little story, very early on we had a phishing site in China and through one of these little groups I kind of put out an email saying if anybody in the group can, uh, has access to the system, would you get me the fish kit, get me the, uh, you know, a couple of files we were looking for that were very specific to this fish design. And about 20 minutes later I got an email with the Credit card information was captured. I got all sorts of logs for SSH. We got uh, just everything. I, I wrote back to the guy and said, listen, thanks. I said, you know, are you going to fix your system now? And he wrote back and said, it's not my system. <laughs> so uh, you got to be careful when you ask for help. <laughs> he figured if it, was, if it was vulnerable, he'd get in as well, which is what he did. But I somehow lost his name and phone number and everything. <laughs> there is. There is one critical point that needs to be made, although I'm very much in favor of all of these groups. Duh! I pretty much created some of them. Uh, sorry, duh! Yes, I like them. They're good, they do good, but they are all goodwill based. Because people want to help each other, people want to share information when their employers sometimes do not want them to share information. They do things out of a free, free time that they don't have because they're the technical people and the management people that need to actually fix these issues for their own organizations. And as long as there is not uh, any meat space and law enforcement, economic, whatever else you want to call these issues to back all these efforts up and not make them in the press to look like vigilante efforts, which they are not. They never take the law into their own hands. They report, they help, they collect information. They're not going to, I mean, I support these groups. I started some of them. They are not going to be the solution. They're not good enough. So we are not good enough. So maybe they need to stop and let... Uh, yes, let's stop and say the internet die. Sorry, the internet is not going to die. Nobody quote me on that. That's stupid. Yes, let's stop and see everything getting worse. That's what we have right now, and that's the best we can do. But it's not good enough. Thanks. Next question. Hello. Uh, I'm from a country that you consider the Eastern Bloc. So. Um, I am a, a client of Adelphia ISP and I've been 
using software like, let's say... Uh, Adelphi no longer exists, I believe. They don't? Yeah, they they don't. got bought. Yeah, Time, <laughs> Time Warner. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I use DC++ to download some things. And I received a letter from uh, a company affiliated with Paramount, which is called Bay, Bay, TS, Bay TSP. Yes, that was the name of the company. And they pointed out specific files on my computer. Uh, I tried this. With, uh, I've heard this that it happened on different operating systems, not only on Windows. And they pointed specific files on the computer that were downloaded on that day, that time, by that username from those hubs. And so my question is, what if you could say more details about how those people were able to read me so clearly? And uh, also, since America, uh, the U.S. is, uh, the, let's say, the backbone of the Internet. Is this going to happen in different countries in the world? People are going to be receiving such letters saying that uh, legal action is going to be taken against them if such files are found on their computer. So are there other countries going to, be, to suffer the same um, consequences? So yes. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we had a, a, a situation about six or eight months ago where we received a letter, an email from like a DCMCA, whatever those initials are, and basically what they stated was that an address that was owned by the IRS was seen sharing games. Um, I got the referral at 3 o'clock in the morning, thank you, I didn't want to sleep anyway. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things we did when we got this referral was we looked at the IP address, and it was space that was owned by the IRS. However, it was space that we weren't using. So one of the next things I did, was there's some underground contacts that we have that monitor a lot of the BGP announcement routes. So I went to them and said, has the, this subnet ever been announced on the internet in like the last 90 days? And of course, the answer was no. We, we went and made sure in our local area network that that address wasn't available. And to make the long story short, that address was never used to send out file games or anything like that. What we suspect happened is somebody that was trying to discredit somebody who was looking for that was sending out fake data that was being picked up by DCMCA or whatever, and then having them go after people that are totally unaware of what's going on. So it's funny you mentioned that, but that, that does happen. Um, we didn't talk, we'll continue with the questions because I see you guys standing for a long time and I feel bad about it. Just one thing, we didn't talk about routing, routing nearly at all. Paul, can you say a few words about uh, private reporting, routing problems and all that? <laughs> private announcing, I'm sorry. It's the only problem when they don't work. Yeah. Um, well, because the uh, BCP38 that's be that tells ISPs and other network owners to, to not let packets off their network, that have a source address that didn't come from that network because that is pretty much the laughing stock of the internet backbone community and virtually no one is willing to turn on the various features of all modern routers built since 2000 uh, that, that, that could just do that with a single thing. Um, you never really know where a packet came from. Uh, you can build up a little bit of confidence if perhaps it's a TCP, part of a TCP session, and you were able to answer it and do a three-way handshake. But that's only a little bit of confidence because all it takes is a, a local area route somewhere in the path that your default route is going to take that you may not be able to see in BGP that will siphon off those packets. Um, and there are plenty of places where, uh, you know, I, I think maybe the whole Internet needs what DEF CON has. This whole wall of sheep concept could be a really good thing. Um, but in any case, there are, you don't have to go to the underground to find out what BGP announcements have been made. There are plenty of, of above-the-table groups that, uh, like route views and whatnot, uh, who monitor the BGP announcements and so forth. And you will be shocked at the number of times that address space that is owned over here is being advertised over there. Uh, maybe it's a little cutout route. Maybe it's the whole thing. Maybe it's something that the real owner isn't advertising any part of. Uh, and then once you get past all that, you'll be shocked a second time to discover the number of times that you have had a TCP session with someone who was never in the global routing table at all. Um, so I would say that uh, there is no cause for confidence. Uh, uh, you know, when, just because you have received a packet, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't believe any part of it, payload or header. Next question. 
Uh, that's actually where my next question was going, was uh, uh, authentication and integrity. Uh, it seems to me that most of these criminal activities have grown because of difficulty in enforcement, and the difficulty in enforcement is not being able to absolutely verify where either email or traffic has come from, uh, part of that issue. Uh, how does the panel feel about uh, new technologies to be able to more positively identify where well, traffic I, is coming from and the, the new sender ID uh, or uh, email sender uh, frameworks? I, I do think it is important to recognize that with the exception of SSL websites, PKI is a complete and utter failure every place it's been tried. <laughs> and we need to, you know, it's 2006, we can admit it, something's really broken in the way that we've been trying to deploy this stuff. And it's not just like, you know, oh, if we throw another couple hundred million dollars at it, it'll work. No, there needs to be pretty fundamental shifts in how we try to deal with identity technology for any of this stuff to work. We've just failed too many times to ignore that obvious conclusion. I, I think you're also underestimating you know, what people are doing. I think that 90% of what we see could be so flagrantly obvious that they're being redirected to like a site in Romania, they'll still click on it. They'll yep. still enter their information. So while the, what you're talking about will address the 10%, 90% of it is stupid people, basically, or people that don't know what to look at, but mostly stupid. One of the one of the issues that we all seem to forget is that the internet was originally, I wasn't there, by the way, I don't think I was born yet, but the internet was originally, yes, I know, but the internet was originally planned as a sharing network, as a let's live and let live and let's be friendly and let everybody use our own SMTP servers and relate through us. And we live on that infrastructure today. That's been discussed um, to dust. And no, the internet is not safe. I'm sorry, whenever I say that, people get shocked. No, the internet is not safe. And email is not safe. Neither is real life. Yes, but the one Someone thing I would like to say, car. though, the one thing I would like to say, though, is that today people don't really, although these issues are there and they are being exploited and they will be exploited even more, I always get pissed at people when they say, hey, this bug is not currently being exploited. We don't need to fix it yet. Right. So two, two months later or two weeks later, it gets, gets, gets exploited. One thing I would like to say is that today with, with botnets, um, you can identify somebody in some cases, and you can say, that's the guy who did it, but it's not the guy. It's somebody else who connected to him through somebody else, through somebody else. Now, every, everyone here knows that. Multiply that a few million, million times, and you'll get a picture of what's going on. You don't really need this reliability. I mean, this reliability would be good. Paul will now answer about that a little bit more. But when you have botnets everywhere, bots everywhere, and their accessibility and cost is so low, you can be anybody you want. I would love the internet to be either completely non-anonymous or completely anonymous, but that's not the case. We Paul? started this. Uh, we started this discussion with uh, phishing, and uh, you know your your grandmother getting an email and having to pay for. Not firearms. mine. I think it was David Dagon's, but sure. Uh, how does the panel and, and Dan feel about some of the the new sender ID stuff for email to weed some of the some of the major phishing stuff out? Uh, in using sender I DNS for sender ID. Uh, how do you all feel about that? Before that we move into spam and before we move into all that, and that's been discussed by, uh, by others, we will answer you. I would like to give Paul the opportunity to speak. He wanted to talk? Uh, no, no, go on. <laughs> it, it is worth, so email is dying. Like, there's entire populations that have moved over to MySpace, have moved over to, you know, only using their corporate work email that's just inside the company. Like, the amount of spam that you can get, I mean, I think 99.99% .99 of my email is spam. And that's without exaggeration. So, SPF, even if it cuts out 95%, is my email really useful? Not really. And it doesn't, and it was never meant for anti-spam. So. Dan, is that why you don't answer email? <laughs> it's no, why that's you because don't it's not. Me, actually. No, no, that, it's actually really funny. I, I can't send mail to Paul. Uh, his mail server says my mail server has been implicated in spam. I have no idea why. He has no idea why. But I don't get mail. Well, from I can't you. either. Don't worry. Yeah, and it's it's a, it's a known problem. It's a known so, issue around the internet. Paul Vix's servers filter you out. <laughs> Next question. Go ahead. So, if you want to steal money, if you want to steal a lot of money, uh, you can do one of two things. You can steal a little bit of money from a lot of people which we've been talking about here so far, or you can steal a lot of money from a few people, uh, which we haven't addressed so far. And I wonder if the panel has 
an opinion, any insights into what's currently going on in terms of extortion attempts and so forth being directed at corporate entities as opposed to phishing and, and carding and so on directed at end users? Uh, I, there's a couple um, more recent things. I mean, the whole extortionware thing, um, where you know basically you get a payload on your machine, it encrypts a bunch of files, which used to be really bad, but actually it's getting better and better now. And then you get a, a message on your machine that basically says, "Hey, you want your files back? Give me money. Send it to this account. Otherwise, you won't get them back." So you know, one, one of the questions that gets asked quite. Uh, frequently on that is why are they only asking for two hundred dollars? You know why are they only asking for fifty dollars? And I think it's a reluctance from the, the um, them knowing and their success rate of asking for a lot more money is probably going to be less. You know if someone's asking for ten thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars, you might go to the authorities. You might do something about it as opposed to just giving a little amount. Then there's the whole you know corporate espionage thing where you know, big attacks are actually a lot more difficult to do. You look at the um, you know, Sumiyoto Bank thing in the UK where th this guy was transferring, I think it was 10 or 15 million dollars, and it just got caught up in, the, in, the, in their monitoring system. So I mean, it's a lot more effective to just trickle money. Uh, you know, a little bit at a time. Yeah, and keep in mind, you know, that as you said, you know, banks monitor this type of things, and you know, and they're swift. And we know that a lot of people look at swift at the moment. So uh, you know, you don't want to send you know that much money that's going to trigger you and uh, be on the top ten watch list. Banks are very, very good at moving money around. The losses we talk about is after they moved most of it back. Now, about extortion on the internet, it's really funny. When you have, a, I guess, New York is the city of choice here in the U.S. When you have problems with uh, protection money, you know that if you pay the guy, you'll probably, most likely, not burn down your store, and you will be back at a set date. Further, if another group tries to take your money away, it will probably protect you. On the internet, that's not the case. You don't know who the guy is, he will not protect you, he is likely to attack you after you pay him anyway, and if you pay him, he will come back. So the whole idea of extortion on the internet is kind of funny to me, but it's a, a, a problem for a lot of people. Um, I think this is more uh, of a good idea for us to shut up and let uh, our FBI friend speak. Uh, uh, sure, no. Um, yeah, we, we do see these extortion things going on. Uh, I think the people that are most targets for it is if they're doing some business that's kind of in the borderline business anyway, so porn sites, online gambling sites, things like, like that, that they might be reluctant to go to the authorities or believe that the authorities are not going to be responsive to their extortion uh, problem will are the ones that are most likely to pay the extortion uh, uh, pay the extortion request. Um, uh, sites that are also... Uh, those two that I just mentioned are dependent on being online. Every second they're not, they're not online, they're losing money. And they're, they're not like um, uh, Fortune 500 companies that may have a lot of bandwidth to back them up and stuff like that. So uh, if it's someone that's susceptible to DDoS, then I, I think they're already, you know, they're, they're ripe pickings for, for extortionists. Um, and uh, I, I think that the best thing that people can do businesses can do is plan for this ahead of time. You know, think, think about what's going to happen if, if someone tries to extort me. You know, have, have a backup plan in place, have that bandwidth available. You know, that's really the best thing you can do. So one thing that seems to keep uh, corporations out of this is it's politically a pain in the ass to pay a bribe. I mean, you have to get approval, you have to figure out how to route the money, what are you going to get a PO to get your <laughs> business back up? I mean. Just like the actual mechanics of how you would route money out is pretty painful. And I think that's, ironically enough, one of the controls that keeps, uh, keeps some of this under control. Yeah, the, it's just the, smart, the smart cyber criminals, the smart extortionists are targeting your non-corporate online entities. Yep. That's what they're doing. Yep. If you've got a sole proprietor who routes through a fair amount of money every day, great target. If you've got something where a PO is involved, move on. <laughs> Yeah, another side of corporations that uh, we didn't foresee is a lot of people, especially in Europe these days, do their online banking from work. They feel their work computers are a little bit safer. Unrelated They're probably still, right. Yeah. Well, depends There's on no how There's no IT much. department at home. Next question. I have actually long ago forgotten what my question was. But um, I wondered if... <laughs> we feel for you. Beer is on me. Um, I think it was somewhere along the lines on what um, you co collectively think uh, we can do on a technical front uh, to secure up the vulnerabilities that are uh, providing the opportunities for these criminals to, to operate on the internet and uh, whose responsibility 
uh, each of you believe that to be? So one problem is just the, the scale of difficulty. I mean, there's an entire use model for PCs, which is basically you don't have a computer of your own or you don't carry around a laptop. You go to a random internet cafe, you use a computer not under your control, and you log into your online banking and move money around. I mean, this is an entire lifestyle that people use that is fundamentally insecurable. Um, you believe it to be fundamentally insecurable? It is absolutely fundamentally insecurable. You've got a device here that you have no controls on. Anyone can put code on it. In fact, you actually had someone who was going around New York and just going to every single Kinko's and putting malware on it. Because he was like, well, people do this. They go to these boxes. They put in their creds. And I can, you know, imagine how hard it would be to secure your home PC if bad guys got a key to your home and just could walk in, get physical access, put some software on, and leave. And so... You know, th that's the scale of problem that we're facing. Um, it really is more of a human problem than it is a technical problem. So uh, is there any point us uh, wasting our efforts securing our applications and building secure by design? And you secure your application so you aren't the source of the problem. But, I mean, there's a global scale of you being the problem, of there being a problem, which we can't deal with. No, no. You can deal with you, you yourself you are being the involved. problem. <laughs> It's your fault, personally. You are responsible for all these fish. No. <laughs> there are a lot of weaknesses, a lot of vulnerabilities everywhere, and the attackers will always go for the weakest link or something similar to that. Now, if you don't secure yourself, they'll go after you. And they do go after you. Yeah, okay, so, so, so what, that's pretty much it. What motivates uh, a company to put out uh, secure software? There doesn't seem to be any efforts going into either rewarding or penalizing. Well, large corporations who are making a lot of money. And hopefully, you know, things like RFPs and buying criteria actually take security into, into uh, you know, their decision-making process. I mean, those are the types of things that have to be driven down from an economical standpoint. Yeah. If, you know, most features wins every time, then we're, we're back here again talking about the same problem. So I you're, think you're relying purely on economic models. You don't think there's any call for government to step in? And no. I think it's unrealistic at a global scale. I mean, what are they going to mandate uh, developers to write secure code? That's just not realistic. Um, to be honest, on one thing though, because I'm usually not honest, I say I'm, I'm saying a, a lot. Of, to be honest, whatever. Um, one thing that is important here is something that KC from Kaida Kaida usually says: every network in history usually had someone who came in and put order in the chaos, no matter if the the water. Uh, aqueducts from uh, the Roman Empire or anything else, somebody came in and made order. Usually that was the government. Now the internet has no government and I'm not sure if we want our governments getting involved in different aspects of the internet. We already see them try on different areas and I believe this cannot be done without the governments. But to be honest, do you want the, any government around the world, and there are a lot of games already being played on these things with uh, user agreements and all that, telling you how to develop your software? Maybe they should. I don't I'm, think so. I don't think it has to be a regulatory effort. But uh, take yes, something if, like if the they AIDS did it. virus that was fought through education. You didn't regulate someone not to go and sleep with someone because they got AIDS. You, you, brought education, you funded education through government and collaborative efforts. I don't think the government should tell us how to do it. I think somebody should... Um, maybe it's peer pressure. Maybe it's more PR. I, I don't know what the solution is. I'm not sure it's the government. I'm not sure I want the government involved, but... Um, it would be a lot better, yes, I agree. Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, but I think in terms of education, I think that's the role that the government can play. We, we can help educate people to these problems. Okay. That's kind of, I know, that's kind of an oxymoron. So, so what's but on the agenda on that can, one? Can I, can yeah. I ask you to clarify your question? Are you asking if there is or is not cause for hope? <laughs> <laughs> because I have cause for hope, and I, I could share it with yeah, you if I that's think, your I question. Think, yeah. Te technically... Uh, is there any way that, uh, that technically, uh, people, process, and technology, do you believe that we can get, get a grasp of what's going on without it being about chasing after the criminals and spending limited resources uh, trying to address the problem from that direction? Okay, so, um, you know, we've talked about... And is responsibility, is it? Is this a regulatory thing or is this an economics thing? And, and those are usually in opposition to each other. Um, I believe it's an economics thing, but it's not a classic economics problem. Now, um, 
We've talked a couple, we've mentioned SSL here a couple of times today. Uh, and it turns out you can have an SSL certificate for a person, not just a website. And so any one of us who wanted to go through the effort of creating a certificate for ourselves and getting it signed could then use that in commerce in about one site out of 10 million who actually knows how to you know, deal with user level certificates. In other words, that didn't really catch on. Uh, had it caught on, then we would simply see the malware looking for you to type in your PIN number at the time you were attempting to use that certificate and capturing the certificate and your PIN number because they've already captured your PC. Um, now, when you're dealing with economics and therefore with human action, you have sort of two very different kinds of human action. There are the actions that you take and the actions that, that affect you on the one side versus the actions that everybody else takes that affect you. Um, if we can get to the point where w the people who want to be safe can be safe, and the people who are willing to go take a class at the community college that's taught on Friday nights or whatever, you know, talking about my grandmother or whatever, in order to learn how, what to click on and what not to click on, we're five minute warning, um, then we could get those people to be safe and that'd be fine. Um, I'm not safe as long as their computers are capable of DDoSing me, and that's a bit of a problem. Um, so there, there's a lot of, of cost for hopelessness built into that, just because as long as we have these monoclonal infrastructures and so forth, we're all going to be sort of in the same stew pot. Um, but I do have cause for hope, and that is that the internet was not built by a corporation who was looking for making a profit. And it wasn't really built by governments or U.S. military or U.S. research money or any of that stuff. Those all had roles to play. It was built by the open source community, although it wasn't called that at the time. Um, and the web, which came after the internet, uh, was also built not by a corporation who was investing and trying to get return on, on that investment, but it was built by the open source community. It was built by experimenters. And I think that the fact that this is a gaping wound uh, is going to cause a lot of real innovation that doesn't have, have to prove ROI possibilities before it'll get out there to come out and give us authentication the same way it gave us the web and the same way it gave us the internet. So that's my cause for hope, is that we're here at all. <laughs> Let, all right, we've got, questions? we've got two more questions for people who've been standing a little while. So let's see if we can get through them. We have like five minutes, if that. All right, I got a couple technical questions, I guess, regarding botnets, and uh, they relate around a um, particular security researcher's efforts. Um, his name's Steven Racing, I think is how you say it, from Switch. Uh, basically, he developed an algorithm that would uh, track rhythm, rhythmic patterns of IRC traffic in NetFlow by looking for the ping pong signature. Although, I believe that uh, it, it's been a while since I read it, but I think maybe one of the problems of it was that the data set was too large, which he was looking at, so you had like tons of false positives. Anyway, um, I guess my question was more of um, applying that on a reduced data set in a sense where the, uh, hold on, it's down so I didn't babble. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, blah. So it was more of like using that as like more of a tool in, in a network where um, since bots have characteristics which are well there There are certainly patterns that you can find in bot behavior and we, those patterns have certainly been used to identify the boxes. Um, if we become a little too dependent on finding these patterns, there are mechanisms you can use to, you know, just stochastically skew your results, skew your time. You can even represent all the botnet traffic to, to every kind of, you know, Short of a person reading the IRC traffic, there's no way to know that it's not just idiots going back and forth. In fact, uh, IRC can be a pretty challenging Turing test. You know, is this a human or is this a bot? I don't know. These people are pretty dumb. Right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, <laughs> you know it's true. I, I guess we'll scale from one to bash.org. <laughs> I think you need to remember one thing again, you know, you're, you're talking about, you know, watching traffic, doing maybe deep packet inspection, you're know, keeping track and so on. Man, that's illegal in most of the countries got a take telco license. No, the, the thing is, is um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to not babble here, but um, I guess what I was saying was it since like a bot, uh, scanning is a, a pretty easy thing to identify and it's a common characteristic of a bot. So once you've narrowed down your data set to like, you know, a specific IP address, it should be a lot easier to use that algorithm in a more... Yeah, it's not we'll hard to, to find user. these bots. They're who not exactly talk? hiding themselves. Yeah, that's all cool and we all use that, but who will talk to the user? Who will pay the price? 
for the people who call the user or who will pay the abuse uh, personnel or will disconnect a paying client. That's always a problem. Yes, there are a lot of technology, everything is being used, but you need to remember that whatever we use, the bad guys compensate for. Okay, last one real quick was another one. Okay, everybody has dark nets, you know, there's public mailing lists, you all guys work together. You look at backscatter, so you still see examples where there's spoofed attacks because you're getting the backscatter in your dark net, yada, yada, yada. What, um, do you see any use of maybe having like, maybe a community effort of compiling the uh, backscatter received in their dark nets to identify um, active targets of a, an attack? And therefore, yes, you could this then is again being apply done that actively. algorithm once you reduce This is being actively down. done, but it can only work uh, to some level. It's, it's like you're suggesting an algorithm for acoustically determining the location of car crashes. So. We have one minute, so right. we want to get the... One answer. last question. Let's go. All right, so uh, it was brought up a couple times, the fundamental problems with, uh, you know, say, DNS or with email. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not naive enough to think that, you know, a complete redesign of the Internet would ever be possible. But are there technical solutions for this that can help mitigate kind of human stupidity? that we've brought up a couple times as well. We can certainly do a better job of giving users a clear path towards being secure. And we can do that through some technical information and we can do that through just guidance and education. That can be done. Can we make it impossible for a user to shoot himself in the foot? Probably not. You can help a guy, you can tell a guy how to be more careful for not getting robbed, but you can't tell a girl how not to get raped, okay? Well, well, Sorry for being blunt. So we'll, we'll ever I'm always to, blunt. Will we ever get to a point, say specifically with DNS, where uh, the problem will warrant a complete redesign of the protocol and kind of sacrificing that legacy support in favor of kind of a whole revolution versus evolution and patching on of, of problems? Paul will finish with this because we have no time. Paul is the most qualified on DNS, I believe. Yeah. You know a little bit about that, right? The internet and DNS and all the other internet technologies, SMTP and so forth, are all laboratory grade. They were not meant to be used in the real world. They were meant to be used between cooperating researchers and whatnot. And the answer is that it, it already warrants a complete redesign, but we can't do that, and so we're doing what we can do instead of what we should have done. And what, what, what's actually preventing that? Uh, you just there. There will be no more flag days on the internet. Where you know TCP is as bad as NCP was, but we can't have another flag day. DNS is as bad as the old sort of host host access protocol, but we can't have a flag day. And it's 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 rolling now. All we can do is try and steer it by poking it with a stick. Thank all you. right. I think we're done here. Yeah. Thank you all. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Dan.